Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast, with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Hey there, Jim. John, my friend, my friend. How you be? I'm good. So we're, uh, this is season four, episode 16. Today we're going to listen to chapter 16. Uh, if I haven't mentioned before, I'll say it again, the fact that the show number and the chapter number lineup is the only thing that has kept this podcast going this season. Because if I'd had, if this were chapter 17 and this was episode 413, it's never happening. It's just not going to happen. I've given up even thinking about it. So I'm glad that you still are because I, I have... Uh... I've taken the advice of one of our listeners who said, I, I think you should stop that. And he was okay. right. And he I have right. since then uh, not commented at all. Whatever you say is right. Excellent. All right. So we're going to listen, like I say, to chapter 16 of the Miser's Dream. But first, we're going to revisit uh, some uh, an interesting uh, story about creating a magic persona uh, by uh, performer and writer and director and all around spoiler of women, John Lovick. Yet. Lovick is so smart. Oh, he's so, so smart. much fun to watch when he's doing his character, Handsome Jack. If you don't, if you're a magician and you have not yet seen him or have not gone ahead and just bought his book about Handsome Jack's routine, you should do both of those things. If you're not a magician, you should still do one of those things. And I'll let you decide which one. Yeah, he's a very smart performer, very funny performer a very sly performer. And I believe he was in uh, one production of Triple Espresso, which was created, co-created by past guest Bill Arnold. Yeah, he's just, he's a director, he's an actor, he's just, he's just done it all. But what I wanted to pull from that conversation with him, and I will have in the show notes, a link to the full conversation uh, in case you didn't hear that, you meaning the listener, not you meaning Jim, because you were there and you heard it. I wanted to just pull out this one thing where you, you were asking him about how did he come about creating this unique character of Handsome Jack, who is so different from who he is. And uh, well, you, you said it like this. John, how does a, a performer magician find their uh, persona, if you will. I mean, yours is is so unique, at least in terms of what I have seen. And I think I've seen, you know, my fair share of magicians. Uh, how did you find Handsome Jack? Well, I would say uh, there were two questions there. One was how did, you know, how did I find Handsome Jack and how should or do performers find their personas, which are sort of the same question, but kind of different because my advice would be don't do it the way I did it and sort of do it exactly how I did it. Uh, and, and by that, I mean, the, the part that is useful to other people is the fact that my persona came about because I paid attention to how the audience was responding to my you know, early magic performances. And I really noticed what kinds of tricks and what kinds of jokes, et cetera, worked and hit and what kinds didn't. And so I, pursued that i've seen you know many magicians who just do what they do doesn't matter if it works or not they just keep doing it because you know that's what is in their head that they should do so the story about handsome jack is like i said magic was my hobby and i was hanging out at the castle and becoming friends with magicians and we were all youngish in our 20s and 30s and this group that I was hanging out with, they were, most of them were at a, a stage where they were just starting to get booked to perform at the castle and just starting to do their first, you know, serious and real professional gigs. And I noticed like, hey, wait a second, after a year or two, all my friends were performing at the castle and I wasn't. So I thought I would put together an act for the parlor and uh, spend a year or so working on it. And if it was if I felt it was you know, good enough at the end of the year, I would audition. And so I had an idea for an act where I would be a sort of, not incompetent, but I guess the you know, Yiddish word would be nebishy. This guy who magic stuff is happening, but it's not magic that I was in control of. For example, like, like the, $11, the $11 trick or the 11 card trick, where you keep counting cards and the number of cards or, or bills of use money keeps changing, but it's not changing because of anything you're doing. It just, it's happening impossibly, but mysteriously. And you don't know. 
And I had an idea to do that. And a thing like I was going to use slide, slide any silks in a way that I was going to do a cards across routine. And I was going to say, we need a, a bridge between the two of you for the cards to go across. And so that I would take two handkerchiefs and tie them together and have each of them hold an end. But then the, the handkerchief, the knot would keep dissolving. And I tie it again, it would keep dissolving. So again, it's magical, but it's not magic I was in, in control of. So that was going to be the whole act. Lots of very magical things, none of which I intended. And one of the tricks was one where I sort of rigged up a, a, a contest where a spectator could win a prize. And then I revealed to the audience that the, that the, the game, the lotto was rigged. And the prize was a date with Mr. Magic. I, and I would always pick, uh, you know, a, an attractive woman from the audience to win the prize. But we didn't know the prize was a date with Mr. Magic. And we didn't know yet that the game was rigged. So that was the trick that played the best in those early shows of mine. Uh, and I thought, okay, what trick isn't working well? And so the trick that was playing the least well, I dropped. And I thought, what's a trick that could go well with this win a date with Mr. Magic? And so I picked another trick that I thought would play well with it. And I sort of repeated that process over the course of the year. I'd say, what's the weakest thing in the act? So I dropped it. What could go well with the things that are working on? And so by the end of the year, all of a sudden, it, I had morphed into a handsome Jack, male model magician. And if you had told me at the beginning of the year, that's what I'd be doing, I would have said, you're out of your mind. I would say, there's no way I would be doing that. That sounds so stupid. That's not my kind of comedy. It's not the kind of th thing we're doing. It's almost the opposite of what I intended. But, you know, there we were at the end of the year, and here I am 25 years later. Well, that was a pretty wild ride for him that year. Talk about listening to the audience. And, and uh, my favorite line is, don't do it the way I did it, but do it exactly the way I did it. <laughs> Which is... <laughs> Which is exactly right. Yeah, it, it is. And it's when I asked the question, he said, well, that's two questions, really. Okay, I, I'm not going to argue with you. Uh, but to come back with, don't do it the way I did it. But then again, do it exactly the way I did it, I thought was terrific. So, And I think he's, he, he's dead on with that kind of talk. How he came about, that, that character, is exactly how all of us should come about if we have the uh, fortitude uh, and the insight that he has. I was going to say guts, but uh, your words are better. Yeah, be willing to look at your act. And again, this is coming from someone who's not a magician. So what do I know? But to look at your act and go, okay, that's the thing that's getting the best response. What would pair well with that? And oh, by the way, this thing that's getting an okay response, I'm going to dump that in favor of something else. The idea for me, if I had something that was working, I don't, it, good enough is good enough. I just yeah. I would have a lot of trouble being brave enough to do what he did, particularly on that level. Yeah, I don't know if I said this in that longer interview with John, but you know my comedic philosophy is: if it works, I keep it; if it doesn't work, I keep it. Uh, it just uh, it it would be so difficult, I think, to do what he did and end up with what as wildly successful as that act is in front of an audience, but also in front of people like, like you and me, who I think are, um, I'm not going to use the word jaded, but certainly we've seen our share mm -hmm. and it tickles us in a way that, you know, I, I can appreciate it, the, the old show business axiom talent can always appreciate genius. I think I have a modicum of talent and I certainly appreciate the genius that is John Lubbock. Yeah. So let me, let me turn it around and ask you because you have a stage persona uh, as an MC and as a host and as a, uh, even as a, a local spokesperson for things. What was your process for, uh, what was the term John Carney used? Honing, uh, sanding, sanding, uh, sanding yourself uh, not in a weird way, to become the Jim Cunningham that we see on stage, who is not far afield from the real Jim Cunningham. I was going to say, first of all, I didn't travel that far from from who I am. So I, I didn't um, I haven't created some alter ego uh, like Mr. Lubbock did. 
I, I just sort of give audiences a heightened version of myself. So it's a heightened version, essentially, of who I really am. And uh, I think I've said this on the podcast before, Lawrence Olivier um, has said, what you do is just steal from everybody. And when you filter it through yourself, it's going to be different. But you have picked up little things from all over the place that then meld into, and certainly starting with my brother, who I spent a lot of time with, both um, as a, a backstage assistant um, and just, you know, as his brother. I, I took a lot from my brother. Um, I've added a little David Letterman, um, our good friend, Jay Nickerson. There's a little Jay Nickerson in here. My partner uh, from the Renaissance Festival for many, many years, uh, Laszlo Nemeshi. There's a little Laszlo in here now. Um, very little. I try to keep that at a, that's yeah. just so, uh, he's very funny though. Very, very funny. I'm not saying he's not, I'm just saying I try to keep that, especially in the corporate setting, uh, yeah. in a, in a little box of its own that I yeah. just open just a crack. He's not uh, safe for work. He's not, no, safe he's work. not, but he's terrifically funny. Um, so it's just a, it's kind of a meld of all of those things, but in when I think about it, it's really not that far a field from who I am, both, you know, just talking to people or individually or collectively. It's it's not a wildly. Oh, I can't believe that 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 guy up there is this guy down here. I don't think anybody who knows me or has seen me on stage. Uh, and then talk to me would find me all that different one from the other. Except when you played that German guy. Yeah. Except when I played, yeah, Joseph Goebbels. And even there, there was a, a little, a little bit of me in that. That's what they were looking for. They wanted to find the, uh, by all accounts, uh, Joseph Goebbels was very charming or he wouldn't have got where he went. And, uh, and so they were trying to find an actor that wouldn't, automatically read as uh, psychopath and evil. They wanted somebody who uh, didn't read that way. And uh, they chose me for no ungood reason, I guess, or for no good reason, I should say. And well, uh, I'll say this for listeners who've been so frustrated playing the Goebbels drinking game on this podcast. You can finally <laughs> toast. Finally, have, we've said the name. Have, have some schnapps, won't you? It, uh, yeah, it, um, it, uh, that was a departure. And I, I, I really enjoyed that uh, playing against what I normally get hired to do. It was an interesting experiment and process for me. I, no one is beating down my door to play the bad guy anymore, but it, it, I really enjoyed it. It was, a, I had to really kind of think about because we, we know who he ends up being, but we're seeing him way early. Yeah. And so who was he before he became what we all know today? So it it was interesting, interesting. And he does turn out to be the bad guy. Spoiler alert. Yes. You've just ruined World War II for everybody. <laughs> um, anyway, enough of personas. Although um, if you, uh, if you want to listen to that full interview with John Lovick, that's in the show notes. I think I'll also have a link to his very funny appearance on um Penn and Teller's Fool Us, uh in which he yeah. used the grappler to great effect and and uh I don't know. I I feel that I was very lucky to have met him when he came to town. Uh he is one of those super smart magicians who's just seems to have, have figured it out. And if you are a magician thinking, I wish I could hire somebody who could help me, I think John is available for that kind of work. He is definitely a director. And he's a, unlike some directors for magicians, he actually has a degree in theater and directing, among other things. He's a very smart guy, so he knows all that stuff. Anyway, uh, before we get to reading, let's do something that we love. Yeah, I think you get to start. I get to start this episode. Can I just say, before we go, that yeah. there's we're actually just telling each other things we love and I, i'm going to just sort of close circuit to you john gaspard there may be at some point uh, a reason for us to pre-discuss this because i don't think it will be too many more could be this time not going to be this time it's not going to be this time all right but it's going to happen we're both going to go oh that was i was going to well 
yes, it could, except you've now, you know, put down the gauntlet. And so I'm going to try to stay a, a far field from where you might end up. Last episode, I, I talked about the movie Phantom of the Paradise. Apparently, a couple listeners have also heard of it. So it, it wasn't uh, as as rare as I thought it was. So I will, I'm going to piggyback off of that with another I love it for uh, Paul Williams, who was the star and did all the music and lyrics for Fan of the Paradise. Uh, there's a documentary that came out a few years back called Paul Williams Still Alive. And the premise was this filmmaker was musing one day, oh, I really liked Paul Williams back in the 70s when he was on all those talk shows and he had all those hit songs with the Carpenters and all those other people. And he won an Academy Award with Barbara Streisand. He was such a great guy. When did he die? And he looked it up and found out that Paul Williams was, in fact, still alive and that he was not the Paul Williams that he knew from the mid 70s and 80s, that that Paul Williams was a drug addict and an alcoholic and to this day considers himself very lucky to be alive. And there's probably no other person who uses the word gratitude more on a daily basis than Paul Williams. But he tracked him down and said, I want to do a documentary about you. And Paul Williams said, I don't think there's that's really anything that would be interesting, but you seem like an interesting person. Um, I'll do it if it's about us and not just about me. Hey, Steve. So, I, you know, if to do a documentary with an actor, it is right. my nature to, like, I mean, as an actor, I can avoid, I ignore the camera, right. you know, or I can be an entertainer and play to the camera. Right. And it's like, and we sort of forget, but but if you're here with me and we can, it, all of a sudden it, it's really authentic if you, instead of trying to play around the edges or whatever, and we pull you in here, it just gets really authentic and it gets my life, you know? Ooh, it becomes the Paulie and Steve show, you know? And so it's a documentary about a guy making a documentary about someone who becomes his friend and looking at the man's past and seeing how incredibly famous he was in the 70s and 80s he was everywhere he 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 never said no to anything and uh how stoned and drunk he was the whole time and there are a couple points in the movie where paul williams gives him access to all of his files of everything he's ever done and uh he has him sit down and has mr williams look at here you are on the mike Douglas show uh with peter lawford uh mike and and Paul Hume says, I am embarrassed. Look at this. We're both coked out of our minds. Uh, the only reason Peter Lawford is there is because they had good cocaine in Philadelphia where that was shot. And he begged me to come be my co-host when I was the host of Mike Douglas show for a week. And it's it's a very grim portrait of the 70s and 80s. And then it's a very upbeat portrait of where he is now, where he is the president of ASCAP and is working diligently to help uh, songwriters get the money they deserve for the the work that they do, and he uh, is very well respected in that area. And he's still occasionally making music. Uh, one of the songs that he did was called "Still Alive," uh, which plays in the movie, and it's about uh, his amazement at still being alive and the people who aren't alive and uh, his gratitude. I don't know you in those clothes. I don't know you with that hair. Two-dimensional reflection, unforgiving, unaware. Part-time dreamer, would-be player. You thought fame could outrun fear. Something clearly terrified you. Did you choose to disappear? Guess again. Guess again. You made friends and some still ask about you now and then. It's a funny, warm, occasionally harrowing documentary called Paul Williams Still Alive. You can find it on streaming just about anywhere. I love it. And what are the chances you were going to have that one? As that you... was very, very slim. Very, very, yeah, slim. very slim. Very slim. Um, but not impossible, but very slim. Okay. What's yours? So I, I actually have uh, uh, a three- Pete, um, if that's okay. That's, um, hey, that, there are no rules. That's rule one. One of the great regional theaters in America happens to be located right here in the Twin Cities where we make our home. Uh, and they just recently did um, three of William Shakespeare's history plays, Richard II, Henry IV in a truncated version, and then Henry V. And I, on three successive nights, saw them in order and enjoyed them immensely. 
uh, and you can't see them because they're closed and, uh, and you don't live in the Twin Cities. But that got me thinking about pieces of Shakespeare that I have enjoyed. Okay. And I went back and revisited Henry V by Kenneth Branagh and then Much Ado About Nothing that Kenneth Branagh put together and Hamlet. And I've watched all three of them since last we talked. I know that's a huge commitment. Particularly but that Hamlet is that the, Hamlet is a, infinity it's, version. It's very good. It's very good. Uh, and the other two are phenomenally good. Uh, it, it's Henry V is terrific, and much ado about nothing. If you are not weepy and joyful at the end, you can't listen to this podcast anymore. Is that too harsh, John? I don't know how you're going to enforce it. I don't either, but. That's my feeling. No, I really enjoyed that. And as you, I think, once said about me, what's interesting about you is you find a topic and then you burrow in and dwell, yeah. <laughs> drill deep. And um, uh, right now, because of the work that was done here locally, I am uh, drilling down on William Shakespeare and all three of those by Kenneth Branagh and many of the same actors appear across those three films which i just love the fact that it's almost a, a repertory company which is the experience we had here locally it was the same group of actors in three different shows in some they had big roles and in some they were essentially carrying a spear um and it was terrifically fun for me as a performer and a, a wannabe actor to watch that wannabe wannabe well, it, you know, you know what I mean? Just a, it, it was a delight. And and so these three films give you the opportunity to see somebody, I think, at the top of their game. Kenneth Branagh at the top of his game doing really good work uh, with classics that you think, oh, my God, I can't sit through Shakespeare. What is he out of his mind? If you look at Henry V and Much Ado About Nothing, there's nothing in those that you are not going to understand. It, it's all, he makes it so clear. The language, as we talked about with the buddy of mine that I go see Shakespeare with, said the actor that can take away the barrier of the language and make it clear to you mm -hmm. um, so that you're not fighting the language, but instead are sim simply understanding and following in these movies, all of the actors are able to take away that barrier. And you're just essentially watching a great story unfold by really good performers. What fire is in mine ears? Can this be true? Stand I condemned for pride and scorn so much? Contempt, farewell. And maiden pride, adieu. No glory lives behind the back of such. And Benedict, love on, I will requite thee, taming my wild heart to thy loving hand. If thou dost love, my kindness shall incite thee to bind our loves up in a holy band. For others say thou dost deserve, and I believe it better than reportingly. Well, I have seen uh, only one of those three. Which three? Which one? I saw Hamlet, and but I will I will make a uh, point of seeing the other two. I would recommend Hamlet, having seen it. It is, I believe, the full text. I think even I think that's correct. Yeah, even the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern searching for Polonius uh, for Polonius's body is in it, which is usually the one of the first things cut is that segment, but it is beautifully done. I believe uh, this may be apocryphal, but when they were shooting it, you know, Kenneth Branagh is playing Hamlet and he's also directing Derek Jacoby, Jack, Derek Jacoby. Jack, Jack, Jack. Yeah, I've heard it both ways. Derek Jacoby is playing his uncle slash stepfather, uh, Claudius, and uh, had famously played Hamlet 30 years before for the Royal Shakespeare and Company. And any time Kenneth Branagh went up on a Hamlet line where Derek was in the area, he would just say the line off camera. He would just feed him the line because he still remembered all of Hamlet's lines. 
You know, the other uh, interesting story about that, and I think this is true, there is a text of Hamlet that has been handed down from uh, famous actor to famous actor. When you sort of become the generational Hamlet, mm -hmm. the former generational Hamlet gives you this text. And I think it goes all the way back to, to David Garrick, which is wow. late 1700s. It's that text that has been handed down. And Olivier gave it to Derek Jacobi or Jacoby. Mm -hmm. And then Derek Jacobi gave it to Kenneth Branagh. I don't know where it is now. Um, but well, Branagh could have given it to David Tennant, who did it famously it after so that. But also Andrew Scott has done it. If you have not seen Andrew Scott do any of the soliloquies from Hamlet, they are all YouTubeable. If you just type in Andrew Scott Hamlet soliloquy, I'll put some links if I remember to do that. But yeah, yeah he, here's a guy that uh, uh, talk about taking the barrier away from the language. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, having seen Hamlet a lot, this is a completely fresh, uh, revelatory. I wish I could have seen the entire thing rather than just these soliloquies but they are so good and so different from anybody else's take on them i would love i would love everyone to get a chance to experience he's very good he's a very good actor he is he's very scary as uh moriarty yeah in the sherlock show which probably would end up as a one of a one of our i love it's at some point yeah. okay well now it's time for you to keep reading or else we're gonna end up uh, going down one of your famous rabbit holes so Let's see, this is episode 416. That means you're going to read chapter 16. So why don't I quickly recap if I can remember what happened in chapter 15. Um, I if I had dinner with Megan, Harry skips breakfast. He got a call and a job offer from his agent. There's Mr. Lime. He did the quarter trick for Lime. And um, the question is sort of posed at the end of that chapter why did both Eli and Tracy recently have what appeared to be accidents? And that takes dun, dun, right, dun. right into chapter 16. Chapter 16. Surely your agent mentioned the costume? Not a word. We were very clear about the costume. Well, this is the first time hearing about it. It might have been cold outside, but there was also a definite chill in the green room backstage at that night's event. The client, a fashionably dressed woman with big hair and a tendency to whisper for emphasis, was not pleased with this turn of events. For the record, neither was I. It's in the contract. You signed the contract, she whispered. I have no doubt it's in the contract I signed. I thought it was a standard contract, I whispered right back. Costumes are always part of our standard contract. They are never part of mine. She gave me a big, phony smile. Why don't we just agree to disagree and you put on the costume? It sounded like a question until she got to the end of the sentence and then it didn't. You know the old adage about the customer always being right? I think that was made up by a customer. My experience has taught me the customer is wrong about 9 out of 16 times. The costume in question sat slumped sadly in the corner of the room. It consisted of a large rabbit about 6 feet tall holding a big black top hat in front of it. I wasn't being asked to be a big rabbit. I was being asked to be embraced by a big rabbit. The idea was that once the performer climbed into the costume, the effect would be that of a giant bunny holding a top hat with the magician sticking out of the hat. While the rabbit's legs would actually be my legs, the illusion that the rabbit was producing a magician out of his hat was a strong one. I knew this to be true because ten minutes later, I was fully encased in the costume and surveying my reflection in the mirror. There I was, a magician in a tux, protruding out of a large top hat held by an even larger rabbit. 
This may be, I thought, the lowest point in my entire life. A figure appeared in the mirror behind me, and I was suddenly proven wrong. Eli, excellent. I was afraid you wouldn't be available. It was Quentin Moon, of course, because that was the only way this could get any worse. Oh, honey, you look adorable. Wait, I was mistaken. Right behind Quentin was Megan, decked out in a spangled dress and wobbling toward me on new high heels. I turned slowly, not for dramatic effect, but because the costume didn't allow for quick movements in any direction. Quentin and Megan stood in the doorway, a stunning twosome ready for the red carpet. And then there was me. You, I said through clenched teeth, trying to will the muscles in my face into a semblance of a smile. I have you to thank for this, don't I? Quentin stepped into the room and clapped his hands excitedly. Guilty as charged, he said. I was talking to the client last night, and I happened to mention my show often goes over much better if the audience has already had a wee taste of magic earlier in the evening. When she agreed, I immediately thought of you, and here you are. Yes, I said slowly. Here I am. Eli, that is such a cute costume. I checked Megan's face for any trace of irony or sarcasm, but came up empty. She sincerely thought I looked adorable. Knowing this, however, did nothing to help make me feel adorable. You're part of the act tonight? She nodded and giggled. We've been rehearsing all afternoon, she said excitedly. I'm not sure I can pull it off, but Quentin seems to think I'll do fine. You'll do fine, he repeated, moving a stray hair from in front of her face. You look perfect and you'll be wonderful. You doing Harbin zigzag? I asked, trying to sound as nonchalant as possible. Mostly, Quentin said. I've also taken a tad from Paul Daniels' presentation, but not so much I feel guilty about it. Tweaked it here and there, made it my own, you know how it is. His tone was very buddy-buddy, like two old pro magicians just chewing the fat. However, I'd never felt less like a magician, let alone the member of an exclusive fraternity. It's really fun, Megan said, clearly not sensing my mood. Took some practice, but I think I finally got the hang of it. But now you'll know how it's done, I said plaintively. You never want to know how magic tricks are done. She waved this thought away with her hand. Oh, Eli, you know me, she said, smiling brightly. I might know it now, but by tomorrow I will have completely forgotten how it works. Despite my grim mood, I couldn't help but smile. I knew that would likely be the case. Mercifully, it was time for me to mingle and amaze. So I excused myself and shuffled out of the room and into the hustle and bustle of the reception, which was already in full bloom. One of the first things you have to get over as a working, strolling magician is the problem of how you approach people out of the blue and ask them if they want to see some magic. Magicians are, not surprisingly, often somewhat introverted, and so going up to strangers is not an easy skill to master. Plus, you're butting into an existing social dynamic and immediately trying to turn it to be about you. You could be interrupting a regular conversation, a friendship-ending argument, or the beginnings of a marriage proposal. I think I've gotten pretty good at it over the years, but that night I discovered almost immediately that if you really want to quickly break the ice with a group of strangers, you need to dress up in a bunny costume. This is certainly true in magic, but I suspect it might have applications in other social situations as well. While in the costume, there was no need to introduce myself, to apologize for interrupting, or ask if anyone wanted to see some magic. When you see a six-foot rabbit coming at you holding an enormous black-top hat with a magician sticking out of it, you pretty much know what the situation is. And if you don't, you want your questions answered pronto. The other thing which surprised me was how much fun I had doing it, and I don't think the costume played any part in this. The hours I had spent at Harry's annoying suggestion, tearing my act apart and putting it back together, had yielded some stunning results. 
During the dismantling process, I had realized that two separate card tricks I did as part of the walk-around act could be combined with very minor changes into one trick, which produces two effects, a climax followed by an even bigger and more surprising climax. This new combination got a much larger, longer, and heartier response than what it had been two separate tricks, and it tickled me to do it again and again for the different groups as I shuffled my way around the reception area. I had also made some scripting changes when I finally admitted to myself the reactions I was getting on two effects were not what I had intended. The audience was way ahead of me on my card-to-wallet routine, and a prediction effect with the color-changing card wasn't coming off as a prediction effect, but instead appeared to the audience as just quick sleight of hand. But with some minor and not-so-minor changes to the setup for each trick, I immediately started to get the right reaction to each illusion. Not all the tweaks I made produced immediate or obvious results, but enough new and good things came out of the exercise that I promised myself to begin the dismantling process on my stage act as soon as possible. I even eliminated a really tough sleight-of-hand move from one trick when I had realized I was only doing the move to impress other magicians. Might have been my imagination, but it felt like I got a better response to that trick than I had in the past because my focus had shifted from being a slick move monkey to actually focusing on entertaining the audience. I was working out how I might tell Harry of these small successes without admitting he had been right when they announced the featured entertainment was beginning and my audience began to stream out of the reception and into the showroom. And somehow, my high spirits chose that moment to exit as well. For the next 75 minutes were a special form of torture. It was time for Quentin Moon's show to begin. I missed the beginning of the stage show because I spent a frustrating 10 minutes struggling to extricate myself from a bunny and not the Hugh Hefner variety. By the time I reached the back of the theater, sweaty and sore, the show was in full bloom. I so wanted to hate it and him, but the bastard charmed me and the entire audience at every turn. When Megan and I had seen Quentin's Chamber Magic show at the St. Paul Hotel, I had been impressed at how intimate and personal he made the experience for a crowd of about 50. Confronted with an audience that must have topped off at around 400, I assumed he wouldn't be able to replicate the feeling of a personal relationship with every member of the audience. But somehow, he pulled it off. I don't know what he had done during the first ten minutes I missed, but by the time I got there, he had won them over completely. When I came in, he was just beginning his version of Houdini's famous illusion where he walked through a brick wall. With the help of several audience members and some discreet stagehands, an impressive and solid-looking wall had been assembled on stage. Quentin recited his patter, which of course didn't sound like patter, but instead sounded completely fresh and improvised as the wall was completed, talking about how Harry Houdini had done this same illusion and had done it so effectively that many people had come to believe he actually could do things like walk through walls. The words, walking through walls, clicked in my head and I got a sudden image of the cops as they struggled to remove the bulky projection room door behind which lay a very dead Tyler James. I hadn't considered this before, but the circumstances of his death did have the distinct feeling of a magic trick, where someone discovered a way to walk through a brick wall without the necessity of something as mundane as a working door. In the case of the trick Quentin was in the midst of performing, I knew how he was pulling it off, but the trick in the projection boot was still a mystery. Quentin completed his walk through the brick wall to a thunderous and well-deserved ovation and moved effortlessly into the next routine. But in his hands, nothing felt like a routine. 
The show was a conversation, which appeared to move spontaneously and randomly from topic to topic the way real conversations do. I knew most of the tricks he performed, but he gave each one a distinctive twist and made them all seem fresh and new. He even pulled out some old standards from every magician's birthday party repertoire and somehow made them seem completely dazzling and inventive. Unlike some magicians, Quentin didn't make his focus fooling the crowd, creating puzzles and daring the audience to solve them. Instead, and I know how hokey this sounds, believe me, he created wonder and amazement on stage, not challenging the audience to figure out how the trick was done, but rather sharing in the moments of magic as he created them. That's not to say everything went perfectly. He took some calculated risks, and on two occasions, I could see a routine was on the edge of failing, but he appeared to have an out for any situation, and from the audience perspective, every routine was flawless. I was reminded of what my friend Nathan had whispered to me during Quentin's lecture at our store. If I were a magician, I'd want to be Quentin Moon, he said not taking his eyes off the presentation. But you are a magician, I had whispered back, also keeping an eye on the lecture. I mean, if I were a really good magician, Nathan had said, and I knew exactly how he felt. For the final illusion in his show, Quentin brought out the zigzag, which is a classic box trick. Some magicians hate box tricks. Some love them. Box tricks come in all shapes and sizes, and generally the effect is pretty straightforward. Something goes into a box and is changed into something else. Might be a showgirl becoming a tiger, or a showgirl turning into the magician, or someone disappearing into a series of smaller and smaller boxes. I never did box tricks much myself because they're a pain to haul around and assemble. Early on, I'd learned to go with the tricks that are easy to transport, particularly if you're doing your own transporting. I know magicians who can do a 90-minute stage show with only the contents of a bag that fits under the seat of an airplane, and that's what I aspired to be. I've spent my life listening to magicians argue over the pros and cons of box tricks, and as I watched Quentin set up the premise for his zigzag routine, I was reminded of something Johnny Thompson, a.k.a. the great Thompsoni, had said on the subject. It was during a visit to the Magic Castle when I was probably 15. When you're doing a box trick, you have to talk the box away. That sentence had stuck with me for years, and it wasn't until this very moment I really understood what he meant, because I was watching Quentin do exactly that. Even though the box was there on stage, big as life, the way Quentin presented the trick, the box was just one small element of the overall effect. In the trick, someone, in this case Megan, steps into a tight, vertical, closet-like box. You can see the assistant's face through a hole at the top of the box, her hand through a hole in the center of the box, and her foot through a hole at the bottom. The magician then shoves two wide steel blades through the box, trisecting it into cubes, in essence, dividing the assistant into three parts, the head, the torso, and the legs. Of course, all this happens behind the door to the box, but the blades look real enough and they appear to go all the way through the box, yet the assistant smiles the entire time. Then it gets really weird. The magician pushes on the center box, shoving it away from the top and the bottom boxes. With this move, the center box is now no longer under the top box or over the bottom box. It's next to those boxes, but no longer part of them. And all the while, the assistant smiles and waves her hand through the hole and wiggles her toes, even though the center section of her body has been pushed about two feet to the left. Quentin talked the box away beautifully. In his version of the trick, 
it wasn't really about the box at all. It was about all of us and our lives today and how we were living them, with Megan standing in as the surrogate for the audience. He talked about the pressures of life, the need to be all things to all people, and how many of us effortlessly move from one role to another throughout the day, in essence, splitting ourselves into various pieces to meet the needs of the people we care about. This patter was made all the more engaging with Quentin's where-the-heck-is-he-from accent and the intimate way in which he spoke to the audience. For her part, Megan didn't have much to do, but she looked lovely with her smiling face peering through the small hole. I had a sudden pang looking at her on stage in this magician's act. I understood I had never offered to put her in my act because she so adamantly didn't want to know how any of the illusions were accomplished. And in my defense, she had never asked to be in the act. Then why would her appearing in Quentin's act hurt so much and feel like, well, a betrayal? If he'd been a lesser magician, would I be feeling the same conflicted feelings? Quentin got to the portion of the routine where he pushes the center box away from the top and the bottom boxes. I knew Megan was doing the lion's share of the work, but to the audience, it looked like Quentin was making a Herculean effort while Megan simply stood in the box and smiled. Quentin stepped away, revealing that a third of Megan was two feet to her left, her hand still waving in the center box while she smiled and wiggled her toes in the other two boxes. In most acts, this would produce applause, polite or otherwise. But Quentin did such a masterful job of talking the box away, the audience leapt to their feet as one, with some people going so far as to cheer and whistle. The audience was still giving this standing ovation when I left the showroom. For all I know, they were still clapping by the time I got to the parking ramp. The parking ramps in downtown St. Paul exist at two ends of a spectrum. A handful are state-of-the-art complexes that are shiny and new and bright and colorful. The rest, however, are drab, low-ceiling, cramped affairs, many of which appear impossibly to have been designed and built before automobiles have been invented or even imagined. The addition of automated payment machines and subsequent elimination of booth attendance has increased the creepiness level by a factor of 10, and I was feeling quite alone as I stepped into the elevator and pressed the button for my floor. The door began to slide closed and then suddenly jerked open as someone must have hit the up button on the wall outside. That someone stepped into the elevator and I gasped. It was an involuntary and, in retrospect, completely appropriate reaction. I thought that might be you. Small world, isn't it? Sherry Lisbon reached past me to press her floor number. I stepped back to give her a wide berth, but she still seemed to be standing closer to me than entirely necessary. She was wearing a long, thick fur coat, which looked anything but faux, and she was made up and quaffed to the hilt. She turned to me and gave me a steady look, challenging me for a response. Yes, it is, I finally stammered. Very small world. Were you working tonight? Yes, yes, I was. Uh, yes, yes, I was. A corporate gig, I added to fill the silence. So where's your bunny? She asked, giving the elevator a cursory once over. I was doing strolling close-up magic, I explained. I left the bunny at home. This was, of course, a flat-out lie, as I haven't worked with a rabbit in years. In fact, I had banned all animals from my act after the tragic intersection between a fugitive dove and a badly-placed ceiling fan. It was for a children's birthday party, and it was a performance for which I ultimately earned nothing but wisdom. The elevator, which felt like it was running at a painful half-speed, finally dinged, signaling the arrival at my floor. 
I moved forward in anticipation of my imminent release, willing the elevator with my mind to stop and the doors to open. Anyway, I said, beginning the end of our conversation, it was fun running into you. The doors opened, and just as I lurched toward my release, she placed what I assume could only have been an icy hand on my shoulder. Mr. Marks, do you mind walking me to my car? She said quietly. I find this parking ramp unsettling. My immediate thought was that I was currently standing next to the most unsettling thing in a six-block radius, but chivalry won out and I reluctantly pressed the closed door button. Sure, I said flatly. We rode in silence for what seemed like a long time, even though the light on the elevator panel indicated we were only traveling up one floor. Upon arriving on her level, she marched ahead of me, her heels click-clicking on the concrete as we made our way through the murky ramp. It was colder here than in the elevator, the frigid air blowing in through the honeycombed openings which covered the exterior wall and provided a limited view of downtown St. Paul. A paid gig, was it? she asked over her shoulder, turning her head only the slightest degree back toward me. Yes, I said, an insurance company, I believe. It might have been underwriters. Ah, well, I suppose they deserve entertainment as much as anyone. Yes, I suppose they do. I don't really know cars, but I could tell immediately which one was likely to be hers. There were plenty of different makes and models parked where we were headed, but the one that caught my eye was low to the ground and sleek. It was a deep, rich red, and it looked powerful and a little dangerous. She hit the button on her key fob, and the car winked at us, silently congratulating me on being so astute. Let me ask you this, Sherry Lisbon said as she reached the driver's door. She turned and looked up at me. This show you did tonight. Yes. Once you accept the job, is that it? I'm not sure I know what you mean. She put her hand on her hip and looked past me, up at the low ceiling. I mean, what if someone calls with a better offer? I shrugged. That's too bad, I said. I already committed to the first show. What if they doubled the money? I shook my head. What if they tripled the offer? Or more? I shook my head again. Still wouldn't matter. I'm committed. She looked at me for a long moment. That you are, Mr. Marks. That you are. Another long, piercing stare from her. For a second, I thought she was beginning to move toward me, and I took a half step back, but it must have been a trick of the light. Instead, she pirouetted and popped the door, sliding smoothly into the low car and scooping her fur coat in along with her. Thanks for keeping me safe, she said, and for a second it looked like she was just about to smile. Apparently she thought better of it, because before I could respond, she snapped the door shut and started the car, backing it out swiftly. She gunned the engine, and the sleek and undoubtedly expensive car disappeared down the aisle, taking the sharp turn at high speed with no indication of brake lights. I could still hear the car long after I could no longer see it. I stood for several moments in the cold ramp and then moved to the exterior wall. I stood in front of one of the openings and looked out, enjoying the icy air on my face. Up to my left, I could see the top of the Cavanaugh Bank Tower. Recognizing this landmark gave me a sudden idea, and I looked to my right, trying to get my bearings. I walked along the wall, peeking out through the open-air gaps, until I had reached the far end of the ramp. I looked straight ahead and was not very surprised to see the ramp was attached via Skyway to Chip Cavanaugh's condo building. In fact, if I hadn't found street parking, I would have likely parked in this very ramp when I visited him. I tipped my head back and looked up, trying to determine which of the lights up there might be his, 
knowing the best I would be able to achieve was a rough estimation. I turned from my attempt and looked back at where Sherry Lisbon's car had been parked and then slowly pivoted and looked back at Chip Cavanaugh's building. It's a small world, she had said, and I had agreed, wondering for a long moment just how small it might actually be. Harry's apartment was dark when I arrived home, so I just continued up the steps to my apartment. I wasn't hungry, so of course I ate. And I was tired, so of course I flipped on the computer and surfed for a while. I made my way to Randall Glendower's website, Geek in the Know, and clicked through the marketplace section to see what sorts of things his geeks were buying and selling at this time of night. On a whim... I opened a message window in the Want to Buy section and typed a short message using the terminology and acronyms which were common on the site. ISO, Classic Lost Lon Chaney Silent Masterpiece. Willing to pay dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. Discretion assured. I looked at my message for a long moment and then clicked the Send button. I waited a few minutes, somehow thinking I might get an instant response. When none was forthcoming, I climbed into bed and flipped on the TV, trying to fall asleep to the lulling sounds of the shills on Sherry Lisbon's Bimax channel. I was near unconsciousness when a resonant ping from my computer brought me back to the land of the living. Curiosity pulled me out of bed, and I stumbled over to the computer jamming my big toe in the process. Swearing silently, I clicked open the message window, surprised to see I had received a response from my request. The message from someone named Classic Seller 58 was short and to the point. May have what you want if London is what you need. Price negotiable. We'll be in touch soon. I looked at the message and the name of the sender, searching for a clue to his or her identity, but nothing popped into my head. I waited to see if more information was coming, but after ten minutes I gave up and shut off the computer to prevent subsequent pings interrupting my sleep. I made it back to bed safely without further injury to my big toe. Sleep finally came amid dreams, which mixed images of Megan in the zigzag box with Sherry Lisbon coming toward me in the parking ramp. In one iteration, her fur coat seemed to come to life, purring toward me like a giant predatory cat. The second fitful night's sleep came to a sudden and abrupt conclusion with the sound of my cell phone. The ringtone, the Rolling Stones' rendition of It's All Over Now, alerted me that it was from my ex-wife. I considered letting it go to voicemail, but at the last second, Grab the phone from the nightstand. Good morning, I said with forced cheer. How are you this fine morning? Not one for pleasantries, Deirdre got right to the point. Are you still in bed? Maybe. You should probably get up, get dressed, and come over here. One of the four suspects your friend Mr. Lime so kindly gave us was just found murdered. <laughs> So this is a very painful chapter for me. I feel so bad or badly for Eli. He is doing a walk around set. He is dressed in this terrible costume, which does exist. You can rent them where it looks like there's a giant rabbit holding a hat and you're, you're coming out of the hat. Yes. I, it is so embarrassing. And then the headliner turns out to be Quentin. He, uh, is fantastic on stage, getting a standing ovation. He's got uh, Megan doing the zigzag girl. Eli leaves. He runs into that scary executive, Sherry Lisbon. I mean, it's it's just a very painful evening for him. And then uh, finding out that someone he's talked to is dead. But anyway, that rabbit, that rabbit in the hat costume, when I found that online, I thought, oh boy, this is... I got to put my character in that. I got to put my hero in that costume. Yes, it's so it's so sad. Now, I know you've done many, many corporate events. 
Can you think oh, yeah. of a costume oh, they put you hundreds in? Hundreds of them. Hundreds of. Uh, What's I, the worst I, costume they ever put you in? And it might have been me. I might have. No, it wasn't you. Uh, it, you uh, not even close. Uh, once I was in a Santa Claus costume for a producer that you know well, mm -hmm. um, uh, and spent three days in this Santa Claus costume with a fat suit and a Hawaiian shirt for most of it, uh, and a big scratchy beard. Uh, that was not the worst. Uh, it, it, as John Mulaney said in Baby J, that's just one of the stories I can tell you. I think there is a uh, Southwestern character named Cocapelli, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. He's blue. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, All right. It, um, there, there have been plenty of those kinds of things. Um, I'm, and I, I try to uh, explain to most of the people that hire me, I'm really better at being me than I am at being something else. Um, if you are looking for something else, I firmly support you hiring somebody else. Yeah. If you're looking for me, I think I do the best me that you're going to find. Um, so you choose what you want, but I, I'm not going to be able to give you, I don't have a huge bandwidth. I'm not that strong a swimmer. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not a performer, although I did, once put on the uh we had a bank client whose mascot was this big bear i think it was a bear maybe it's a chipmunk i don't know it was the stinkiest costume with the stinkiest right. head it was just they'd never had it cleaned i'm sure that even mold would go in there and go oh i'm not going in here <laughs> the the best story though was one of my co-workers when we were working on the the pillsbury bake-off got to dress up in the Pillsbury Doughboy costume, which is inflated from the inside and is kind yes. of air-conditioned inside, and went on the Martha Stewart show, and Martha Stewart poked her right in the, in the tummy as, <laughs> yeah, as a Pillsbury Doughboy. So that's the upside of uh, costumes. The, the downside is being a magician who's stuck inside a hat being held by a giant rabbit. It's uh, Harvey gone crazy. Uh, no, not for me. Not for you. All right, well, that's as bad as it's going to get, I hope, for Eli and the Miser's Dream. Next time, we'll listen to Chapter 17. We're also going to, also going to chat with uh, Jamie Ian Swiss about, well, about everything except the thing I wanted to talk about. The thing I wanted to talk about was food, because he loves talking about food, and uh, we didn't get to it. <laughs> We're probably Eleven. back, but we talk about everything. We talk about Eugene Berger, Johnny Thompson, Penn and Teller, anti-magicians. He's a wide-ranging fellow. And, it's a and I had no, uh, you know, I think I knew Eugene well. I had no idea that he and John, uh, Jamie Ian Swiss were close buddies. Yeah. So, None. and you guys have an interesting link in that you both uh, were probably two out of the only three people in this country uh, to do uh, Eugene's Spirit Theater show. Correct. So we'll find out all of that and more with Jamie Ian Swiss next time, uh, along with Chapter 17. Until then, stay out of stinky costumes, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Or not. Get into a stinky costume. See where it leads you. This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast, with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham. Produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.